Fleur Perlin is a successful French businesswoman who founded an investment fund, Corelia Capital, which nurtures Korean and European startups. But her background is much more complex. Abandoned as a baby on the streets of Seoul, she was adopted by French parents, grew up in France, and became that country's minister of digital economy and culture. Just 10 years after she first set foot back in Korea, she and her company are serving as a bridge between Korea and France, Asia, and Europe. On this episode, our globalist is Fleur Berling, who has not let boundaries of race, nationality, or gender limit her possibility to succeed and nurture others to follow. France's South Korean-born former culture minister, Fleur Perlin, has been awarded the Legion of Honor, France's highest decoration. I can really be a good opportunity, a good bridge between France and Korea. All the time when you talk about France, it's always about heritage or old things from the past. So I really wanted to change the image abroad. Welcome, Ms. Fleur Berlin, to The Globalist. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let's start off with your book. I mean, it was just published in Korea and it was written by you in, in French. But this was a book for Korea, for Koreans. Um, why did you feel the need to write this book? And what, what, what did you want to say? So I left Korea when I was uh, uh, six months uh, and I came back as a member of the French government and I had never set foot you know, on, on, on Korean soil in mm. the meantime. Uh, and so at the time when I came back, a lot of Korean people and especially journalists would ask me, so what does it feel to be back in Korea? Do you feel now that some part of you is Korean? And actually in France, you know, we have this very philosophical notion of being a citizen of, of belonging to a nation that is really related to adopting the values of a country, uh, relating to its history, its heritage, and it's very intellectual. It's nothing to do with the blood, actually. It can be, you know, have foreign blood, but be French. And so my answer was, you know, I felt awkward because I understood that they wanted me to say, yeah, I feel part of sort of, you know, half Korean. But I said, no, I'm French and I feel French, but I'm happy to be here. And a lot of people were shocked by this answer because they thought, okay, she has DNA that comes from Korea, she has Korean blood, she should feel Korean. And so I, I felt that I probably need uh, to explain that answer. So at some point I was, you know, thinking I should give you some explanation as to why I said that at the time. In, in that preface of your book, I mean, you, you talk about that moment in 2013 when you first came back to Korea after 40 some years. You are a, a minister in France. Um, you arrive at the airport and the doors open and you walk out and, you know, there, there are these Korean reporters waiting for you even though I know that um, you don't have these kind of memories. But what was going through your mind as you walked through those doors? Actually, I, I was so overwhelmed because I was surprised. I knew that, you know, my appointment in the French government had um, drawn some attention on, on me and there had been some television, you know, uh, show about my uh, participation in the, in the campaign. So people sort of started to know me a bit in Korea. So I knew that there was some media attention, but I was very surprised to see so many people at the mm. airport. And then the whole time, uh, I was always surrounded by many people, uh, always asking me a lot of questions as to, uh, so what, what do you feel to do this for the first time in Korea? What do you feel? And actually it was so overwhelming that I could not feel anything actually. So 
my first intimate reconnection to Korea came much later, actually, when I, I was not on official trip, because I think this, you know, organization and the fact that I was always uh, over solicited by <laughs> a lot of people uh, made me really unable to have a, an intimate experience mm -hmm. in the country. So I was just trying to do whatever you know, people expected me to do, but I did not feel anything personally. Mm. So this personal reconnection came much later, I think, yes. when I was alone and I could make friends and I really had the time to, to reconnect uh, in a proper way. Mm. So you was, it was quite shocking for you and, and the kind of reaction that you got from the country of your birth. Yeah, yeah. it was both shocking and, and really nice because I remember visiting a, like a, a market, you know, very popular market in, in Seoul. And some people, like, you know, unknown people to me, offered me gifts in the street, like, you know, small silk items. And because they recognized me maybe from television or from the newspaper. Uh, and a lot of people would tell me, coming from all sorts of backgrounds, would tell me, we are very proud of you. And proud means like, you know, okay, you're sort of part of the family. Mm -hmm. You went away, you came back and you achieved something and we're proud of that something. And it made me, I, I thought it was very moving and very touching. Uh, you know, this also acknowledgement that, you know, I make people proud in Korea. So mm. it was both shocking because a bit surprising, but very, very moving and touching. The other aspect of it, do you feel, I don't know if the word is um, resentment or sadness toward this country that um, sent you away? Absolutely not, actually. And when I was writing the book, you know, I trying to analyze the reasons why it was not so easy for me to reconnect immediately to the country or to answer the, to the question, do you feel a bit Korean? Yes, I feel a bit Korean, which I do actually now. Uh, but at the time, it was difficult for me, and I tried to analyze why, because I'm a very analytical person, as a good French person. And I was thinking, so maybe, you know, very deep inside, uh, there are things that I didn't really want to um, think about because mm. they were painful. And maybe the fact to have been abandoned and, and adopted is not something that is very easy to, um, you know, to, to digest yes. uh, as a child or as an adult. And so probably, I think I must have at some point felt that, you know, oh, it's a bit too easy now to claim that, you know, okay, Korea is proud because I'm a minister. But, you know, mm. what if I hadn't been successful? Uh, why didn't this love come earlier? Uh, so probably at some point, I thought I wanted to take my time and to do it at my rhythm, not, you know, the reason that people mm. wanted to impose me. But it was not really resentment. It was just the fact that I felt I needed to take my time and mm. do it in the right way mm. uh, so that I could come back in a very, you know, peaceful and quiet way. And it sort of comes through in, in the title that you wrote in French, actually, which is, I guess, it's a life led between two shores. Yes. Which meant it's sort of, this is where you're, you find yourself now, between the shores of Korea and France, I yes. guess. Yes, because I, I actually, I don't count the day that I spent in Korea, but probably since 2013, I must have made like 40 trips. So I came really uh, many, many times. Uh, and I really enjoy now uh, being here. I've made a lot of friends. I was throwing a party yesterday with some friends of mine and I was looking at them all and I was like, in five years time, I made really very, very good friends here with whom I can, you know, talk freely, uh, open my heart. It's, it's amazing. And I kind of feel home when I'm here now, mm -hmm. which is, you know, exactly the point where I think the Korean journalist wanted me to be uh, six years ago or seven years ago. I'm there now. Yeah, <clears throat> you've made that circle into the, the exactly your own path exactly. into um, Korea. The Korean title is, is a little strange. Do you find that strange? Because the Korean title says, is it to win or to enjoy? Yes. So the idea is that I, I, I think I was never a super ambitious person, which you know, people might think, well, okay, she's not very sincere by saying that because she had a, you know, a very strong academic uh, uh, curriculum and then a career. Uh, but then, you know, for me, I thought that 
okay, I'm trying to achieve this goal. If I don't, well, it's, you know, it's not such a big deal and I'm not obsessed with a certain, mm. you know, uh, direction of uh, or achievement. And I think the more I grow old, uh, the more enjoying life is important, actually. And by enjoying, I mean, you know, it can be very simple pleasures of life and just having a nice dinner or a norebang party with mm. some friends, but discovering new people, discovering new countries. So uh, for me, along the journey, success has happened. But if it had not, you know, the fact that I would have enjoyed the, the journey, you know, just trying, uh, would have been enough for me. Mm. So I think it's also a sort of ethic of... Mm. Um, sort of state of mind exactly, type of thing exactly. that, that, that sort of led you. And maybe it's a message it that I wanted to convey to, Korean, to the Korean people because I feel that there's a strong culture of performance here. Oh. Uh, achievement, excellence in school, uh, excellence in the you know, academic uh, uh, curriculum, the diplomas. So this is very important and there's mm. probably a strong pressure to perform, to be the best. Um, and I want to say that you don't need to be number one all the time to be happy or to satisfy, you know, people around you. Mm -mm. But that's very yeah. unusual because we sort of assume mm. that because although you are French, you know, you have non-French blood, um, rising within the ranks of France, becoming a minister in a French cabinet, must have been a very difficult process. I um, mean, that you had to fight, you had to be very competitive in that process. Actually, I think I, while I was writing the book, in looking back at, my, you know, at this journey, because I was coming from a very modest background and because you know, climbing the social ladder requires to uh, acquire some codes, like mm. behavior, um, conversation, uh, reference, cultural references, these kind of things, make you feel very like you're not in your in your place when you you start you know meet networking with people who uh, are not in the same class as mm. the se same social background as you and so at the time it must have been very violent but i didn't realize that i was just trying to absorb you know as much as i could just to fit in the environment and mm. nobody could think okay she's an imposter mm. But this imposter syndrome that yes. many people who change social class, you know, know, and I think you can never get totally rid of it. Uh, it must have been very violent, but I sort of, you know, probably put it under the carpet and just, you know, tried to work my way mm. up the ladder. So it's, it's very paradoxical because it's true that it must have been, you know, I realize now how difficult it must have been. But I was not thinking at the time at the difficulty mm. because maybe at the time if I had thought about it and tried to really, you know, think about what I was doing, what I was, you know, going to achieve, maybe it would have made me very uh, frightened. Yes. And maybe I would not have succeeded yeah. then. It was probably something that you even didn't have time to think about at the moment. Maybe, you know? maybe. And, and that's also something that um, women everywhere, I mean, of course, anyone who is sort of trying to um, adapt to a different environment and climate is, is always feels that. But for women in particular, I think because they are this, this kind of climbing up a ladder is relatively new for women, it is a difficult process. Is that one of the things that you felt um, could have made you a role model for a lot of Korean young women as well? Probably, because I can feel there's, uh, there's, there are some differences uh, in the status of women uh, in France and in Korea. And some things are really just very, like, you know, from an organization point of view, the fact that we've access to a lot of help from the government and local governments for childcare, mm. so that we can have professional careers. And you look today at the employment rate of women, it's, it's, it's the same as, as men. So I think the, so the French society has really factored in the fact that gender equality, equal pay, uh, the fact that women must have the same chances as men, uh, it, it's now a given. It's, it's something that's natural. We are not there yet. But, mm. you know, the fact that we should aim at this objective is something that everybody uh, acknowledges and accepts. And so uh, when I was pursuing my career, I never thought that I encountered sp specific hurdles because I was a woman. Mm. What I realized is, you know, I was, uh, I was in an environment like the political uh, environment is very, is still very male dominated, right? Yes. So there are still some habits, 
you know, like for example, if you're a woman and you go to the National Assembly, I was, I was presenting my budget, the budget of my ministry to the members of parliament, and they would ask me very technical question, mm. as if they wanted me to fail, you know, to answer, mm. and okay, this woman is not very yeah. They skillful. think it's a, because it's a woman, they are probably, yeah. you're and probably And I could, you know, I, I, I really noticed the difference when a, a male, one of my male colleagues was asked questions, they were more high level questions, very political questions, but not oh. questions that were conceived as trapped as straps, mm -hmm. right. So I, I saw that there was still this, you know, idea that, okay, women are not so legitimate mm -hmm. in this position, in these power positions. You had but to prove that you, you are... Exactly. You, you are, prove your skills. Yes. Yeah. But that, that didn't prevent me from having this career. And also, I must, if I'm very honest, I must say that at some point, because I was a woman, I was given a chance also to join the, the campaigning team. And I benefited from this, you know, gender equality sort of mindset that people have. So I'm very thankful also to the French system to make it, uh, uh, to make it possible for women also coming from you know, modest backgrounds mm -hmm. to make it to the top. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible. Mm. The possibility is a, is a great factor that uh, a lot of young women need to hear. I think so, yeah. 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 So your company, Corellia Capital, works with many Korean and European um, investors in sort of supporting startups in both countries, in both continents. Is there a lot of untapped potential in this market? I think so. And that's the reason why I created the company, actually, because in France, uh, there are some you know, investment companies. Uh, some of them actually are interested in doing cross-border investments. Some of them are really interested in Asia, but mostly in China. Mm. And actually, none of them, you know, really invested in the creating a relationship with Korea, which I think is a, you know, is, is a pity because Korea has a lot of potential in terms of technology, uh, large conglomerates that are, you know, very advanced and very innovative. So I always thought also that we, we have some, you know, compatible business cultures between France and Korea. So I really wanted to uh, create a business that would first invest in European businesses mm. and try to develop synergies with Asia or with Korea uh, and create some value with mm. the synergies. And these synergies can be business development, they can be, you know, attracting Asian capital into the capital of these companies, but also technology. Mm. Um, and then my plan was in the midterm to do the reverse, so to invest in Korean companies and to help them develop their business in Europe. Mm -mm. And so now we are just at the beginning of this phase. So we invested in European uh, uh, startups who, who have the potential to become category leaders. Mm -hmm. And now we are going to start investing in Korea. We're super excited mm -hmm. because I think the Korean uh, startup ecosystem is very vibrant, very dynamic. Uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to investing in, in mm -hmm. Korea. And I also heard you talking a lot about K-content, K-culture. You don't usually um, connect culture with startups and invest in, uh, and in venture capital, but is is that a, a a potentially very promising area? So I think the very interesting thing, and I'm speaking as a former minister of culture in a country that That's is true. so proud of its mm. you know heritage and culture, but I think you know Korea has outsmarted France in terms of soft power uh, recently in the recent years thanks to this you know Hallyu policy that is really amazing and that creates great success. And I think thanks to this uh, context that, you know, now the K-contents are really uh, recognized all over the world and people want to, uh, to, to watch TV series, want to listen to, to K-pop, want to eat Korean food. I think this has created a sort of mindset worldwide, but also in France, where people are very interested in everything coming from Korea. And so this is a very good time, I think, either for Korean IP, Korean contents, Korean brands, to really start developing in, in France because the market and the, and the con consumers are really ready now, they're educated mm -hmm. about Korea. 15 years ago would have been too early, but right now I think you know, people want to adopt things that they can relate to Korean lifestyle. And I think startups are really also you know, um, uh, in, in, in the same, uh, uh, can benefit from the same environment, very mm -hmm. positive environment. Uh, Korean startups, for example, you know, active in the metaverse, Web3, or, uh, 
are also content, you know, Webtoon, for example, I think you have a great opportunity now in Europe mm. because, you know, the first Hallyu wave has paved the way uh, to create a very good acceptance and a, a very good, uh, you know, welcoming market for, for Korean content or Korean startups. Mm. But you talked about the K-content and, um, and as a cultural minister, you know the value of, co of culture and, and communicating between different cultures. But they're very uniquely, it's, it's a Korean story. I mean, yeah. I don't, we don't know how that would um, relate to the world. I know, that, that's what's fascinating. But I think the first waves of Hallyu created some interest uh, in Korean culture and pe people became more knowledgeable about Korea and make them, you know, interested in, you know, very Korean contents like Wuyong Wu, for example. Mm. I watched it, I was so interested, but I spent a lot of time in Korea, so I knew that every episode was dealing with a very hot topic in, in Korean society or in the political debate. So I, I was very interested also from a sociological mm. or political mm. point of view. But, you know, I think people even not, you know, so knowledgeable about the Korean context, because this, you know, handicap or overworking of children, everybody can relate to that because at the end of the day, even if it's a very Korean topic, it points to a very universal topic. Mm. And I think because people got used to watching Korean drama before, they could have access to, you know, even very Korean contents like Wuyong Wu, for example. So I think the successive waves of Hallyu, it was so smart because it made it possible for very Korean content to become, you know, Accept, to be able to yeah. reach a very vast audience. And yeah. that's what makes the success of Hallyu, I think. It's yeah. amazing. It is amazing even for Koreans, even you know, for Koreans who, who enjoy watching Korean dramas, but can't imagine why anybody that is not Korean would enjoy those dramas as well. You have a very unique um, experience. Um, background and you talked about becoming that bridge and I think um, people are amazed at the fact that you have become this and you are um, trying to become this bridge between Korea and France, Asia and Europe. Do you think you, you have a unique advantage in bridging the differences between the two? I, I think so. Maybe it's an unfair <laughs> advantage. But people who want to do something, whatever, in Korea, but maybe you know, export some food or whatever. So now they come spontaneously to me like, okay, I want to do this in Korea. Can you give me a hand? Can you help me? So it's nice because it's really the, the thing I wanted to achieve. And uh, I think that the, the fact that I'm becoming a bit more notorious now here in, in uh, Korea, that people also identify me and uh, reach out to me for the same reasons, so I think I became, yeah, a sort of natural point of entry or gateway yeah. to the other country, yeah. which is really, really nice. You sound like you are amazed by the fact that you have become this kind of person. Um, and you would not have imagined that would have be, been the case just a few years ago. Yeah, actually, if you had told me that maybe 15 years ago, I would never have believed it because I wanted to avoid, you know, coming back because it felt awkward or uncomfortable. And so maybe if I had not had the chance to create this company with the help of Naver, um, maybe I would have never come back to Korea. I still think it's an amazing twist of you know, fate uh, that I could come back in such good conditions and reconnect in such a nice way uh, with the country where I, where I was born. So yeah, I'm amazed. Yeah. It is an amazing story. And, and I know you, you know uh, Min Jin Lee. It's something that, that you know, novelists like Min Jin Lee write about. <laughs> Exactly. So I met her actually, yeah. <laughs> incidentally, uh, a few weeks ago in, in Seoul, we were in, speaking in the same conference. And actually she told me something interesting. She told me that probably if, there, if it was not for this Hallyu policy, maybe Pachinko would not have been so successful. Because mm -hmm. Pachinko speaks also about something very Korean. Yes. I mean, you know, to understand this nostalgia, this sadness uh, due to the, you know, the, 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 the colonization, it's something very Korean, right? But it became such a worldwide success first because she managed to write it in a way that you know delivers some universal messages and she really says that it's because of the Hallyu policy that she could mm. be so successful so she says that she, she owes a lot to this to this policy yes. well um we're we're very glad that globalists um of korean blood like min jin lee and you are are 
so successful in, in what you want to achieve. And we wish you great success in the Thank future. Thank you very much. Kamsamida. Thank you. Samida. Thank you. And next week, I will be back with another globalist who is putting Korea on the map. So that's it for me. Sonjie, out.